With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, we have this week's almond update, which is on incentive resources that are available to support producers with farming practices. And we also have information on the final snow survey of the season, which showed an above average snowpack. But we start today with Cindy Zimmerman. First of all, if you would, please introduce yourself. My name is Austin Valancourt, Senior Business Manager from GIVO. Well, you are here at the ACE Fly-In here in Washington, D.C. This is your first experience here. What did you think of it? Oh, well, I was just telling Brian that, for one, I think just being in D.C. is, uh, it, it, you, you, you have this energy, right? So just being here has been great. I think, uh, yeah, I had some great time with, with various senators and, and, and Congress people's staffers and uh, had opportunities to explain to them the, the things that we're concerned about here at GIVO and more broadly for ACE and uh, really focused on the, the, the tax credit discussions and, and how, how we can, you know, best serve, serve them and, and what they're looking to, to get over the line and, and be a resource to them, but also advocate for the policies that we think uh, should be advocated for. And that's really going back down to the field level and measuring the, the activities at the field level and translating those benefits down through the, the full, full supply chain to the biofuel. Well, of course, Jibo is one of the big names in the business right now. What uh, what's the latest news on Jibo? Well, we're you know we're still actively pursuing the the financing of our first commercial facility, Net Zero One, um, and so we're in, in the process of that. We're working with the DOE uh, loan loan program office, and so um, that's a going through the due diligence process right now. Um, but you know things are are progressing in the right direction. Um, That'll be the once we reach financial investment decision. That'll be the, the when the clock starts uh, for the construction of the facility. So, um, you know, we've got the contracts in hands to substantiate that build out, and just a matter of working through those financing steps. To, we've got the engineering done. Um, so, uh, once yeah, once we re- re- get through those due diligence efforts, the the plant build will really kick off and then the clock starts so well how important is the current uh, effort to get the greet model right for those saf credits tax credits that are in the ira for GIVO going forward yeah sure that's i mean it's critically important um it's it really comes down to just having certainty and so um Right now, the lack of certainty as to how how much value is available in those tax credits and in, in, in the final rule has it will be written, particularly as it relates to those on farm practices and, and the climate smart agricultural practices that we, uh, we believe should be incorporated, and then also the the land use change. So how they will be uh, evaluating the land use change element of the carbon intensity score, but ultimately, yeah, having certainty around what that looks like. Um, is critically important for us to model out the financial economics and performance of this facility where we're, we're seeking investment. And so without that clear picture, it's, it's really hard for investors to um, make that decision m- moving forward. And so until we, ha- until we have ruling around that, I think it's going to be challenging um, to, to move forward. And so we really are eagerly awaiting the the rules that are we're we're, we're, so, we're supposed to uh, be set March 1st for 40B as as and and we would look to look to that as kind of expectations for 40 the pending 45Z how much are you doing working with farmers as far as adopting climate smart agriculture practices yeah so we have a climate smart commodities grant a 30 million dollar grant from the USDA so we are actively working through that and it's a it's a on a daily basis, we're working with growers. So we've got a, a team right now that uh, interfaces uh, with, the, with the growers, both in the Lake Preston area where we have our facility, or we will have our, our Net Zero One facility, and then uh, with our USDA project partner, Southwest Iowa Renewable Energy, Sire, uh, we also have a network of growers in their area that we're working with uh, yeah, to, to get them signed on, um, meet them where they're at. It's, it's really a great program that doesn't require them to change any practices, and they can immediately start getting compensated for those practices that they've already got uh, deployed on farm today. Um, and so, 
yeah, it's, it's very, it, it's a, that's a great program, that one in particular, uh, around the USDA. Um, and then more broadly, you know, we're, we need to do that for our business. And so that's something that we're focused on. I will say we started prior to the USDA award building that network around Lake Preston. And uh, we've had 100% retention rate in the grower program that we, we've kicked off. So year over year. So that was back in 22, I think. If I'm remembering this correctly, and then in 23 we had 100% retention uh, in, in that grower season. So things seem to be working well. There seems to be a good understanding between you know the leads over there and and the growers just kind of driving that that relationship and building that trust. Anything else you want to add? No, just express gratitude and thanks to the Ace organization for putting this together, and it was just a good first experience to journey through the. The various government buildings. Fortunately, I had my director of government affairs, Kathy Bergren, here. Who this is her stomping ground, so I was able to tag along. But just a great experience. It's it's always useful to hear the feedback that we receive in these conversations uh, with staffers um, and and others here in the room today. So got a good opportunity to exchange with other ethanol plant owners and and those in, involved in ethanol plant operations and just hearing the feedback, the things that they're concerned about. Um, and some of the, you know, the skepticism that they've heard in their exchanges around climate smart agriculture. And it just really helps us kind of address those concerns, right, as we go out to the market and look to really deploy this and gain benefits and provide those benefits back to the growers where, where we think they deserve. So you've got a lot of good insights here then to bring back to your company. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right, excellent. Well, great to see you here at the Ace Lion in Washington, D.C. I'm Cindy Zimmerman. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. In today's national spotlight, weeds cause a tremendous reduction in the yield and profitability of crops every year. Chad Smith has more. New technology that may be commercially available as early as 2025 will be a huge help in the battle against weeds. Kip Tom is a member of the board of directors for Harp Bioherbicide Solutions. He says biologicals are a new approach to controlling weeds. There's been biological herbicide for a number of years in the marketplace, but quite frankly, a lot of them very low efficacy and really dealing with some of the weed species that we deal with here and especially North America and around the world. But TARP is very unique in that it has a high rate of efficacy. There is no known resistance to it and it brings a good value to the marketplace. It gives us another option. We haven't seen any new modes of action, I think, for almost 40 years coming to the marketplace. So this is something that's completely different and uh, gives us the ability to control some of those tough pests that we have in our farms. He says Harp Bioherbicide will truly be a plant-based product. It's based on two mint oil extracts, so it is truly plant-based. EPA's uh, approval on this is going to be pretty rapid, I believe, from what I hear from everybody, which is much different than the synthetics today. You know, the synthetic products, to get them to the marketplace, can take upwards of 15 to 17 years, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment without knowing whether it's going to be approved or not. So this is something that comes to the market at a time that's really needed because farmers across the United States at a higher rate are seeing more resistance to the products that we're using, and we're seeing these weeds flourish. Tom says the product will be used as a standalone or in a tank mix and drive value for producers. If we can go out and control a pest, a weed, with a product like Harp Bioherbicide with one application, it's not going to be just that one-year impact. We're stopping it from producing seeds that may produce millions of seeds that's going to be on that acre of farmland the following year, which only grows that weed species and that resistance in those fields. Having something like our biological herbicides that can have an impact immediately and affect a farmer's bottom line and be safe to the environment, safe to the consumers. There's a lot of positives to go along with a product like our bioherbicides. HARP will source some of the base materials for its bioherbicide from farmers around the world who grow mint. HARP bioherbicide will also work on different kinds of operations. This product can fit into not only that commercial farmer's business where he uses maybe some synthetics and is tank mixing this product with it, but it can also fit into that organic producer. So you can cover the wide spectrum of control that's needed from that organic to that commercial producer. I know a lot of times when you throw the word biological into it, right away a lot of farmers believe that the efficacy is going to be somewhere closer to 50 
50, 60 percent. The reality is the efficacy of this product in the formulations that they're producing it in today here in 2024, it's going to be as good as or probably better than that of the typical synthetic products we buy in the market. More than 1,000 field and greenhouse trials have been conducted and are being expanded this year. Heart Bioherbicide should be available to use no later than 2026. Chad Smith reporting. That's today's National Spotlight. In the Livestock Report, the nation's hog producers are doing all they can to cope with some challenging market conditions. Here's Gary Crawford. Pork producers would like to be able to keep production under control to help boost hog prices or at least keep them from falling any more than they have already. But that effort is being sabotaged in a way by the efficient manner of hog production, namely... The big uh, increase in the pigs per litter rate. Agriculture Department Livestock Analyst Mike McConnell. Yeah, uh, that's, you know, we've, we've seen the past couple reports is a big uh, increase in the pigs per litter rate. And then that continued through the last quarter um, between December and February. During that quarter, the average pigs saved per litter was well over 11 and a half. And it was only about 11 pigs even during the same three-month period a year ago. And here is why this is so important. Taking a look at recent trends in the hog market, Mike McConnell says for farrow to finish operations the last year or so has not been the best, in fact. Returns have been negative and pretty largely negative over the past year, going you know for most of 2023. To try and fix that, producers have been trying to reduce production or at least stabilize it by reducing farrowings. USDA's latest hogs and pigs report says that During the December through February quarter, producers farrowed almost 2.9 million head, a 3% reduction from the same quarter a year ago. And the USDA report also carries information on what producers intend to farrow. And they tell USDA that for the March through May quarter, they will cut farrowings by 1% from a year earlier. And for the June through August quarter, the cut will be 2%. All of this designed to curb pork output. However, the uh, the improvements that they're getting on the pigs per litter rate and the, the productivity out of their sows is is surpassing that. And as a result, we still have a, a bigger pig crop despite the lower farrowings. The pig crop at last count was still running 2% larger than one year ago. Pork production this year may also increase by 2%, but things may still turn around for pork producers thanks mainly to projected increased demand for pork this year. Demand analysts say could bring average hog prices for the year up around 3.5% compared to 2023. That prediction was made several weeks ago. USDA will issue a new forecast for pork production and hog prices Thursday, April 11th. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This is the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson, and we will be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's Agnet West headlines, here's Agnet West Farm News Director Brian German. The Federal Aviation Administration has granted a groundbreaking exemption that could have a major impact on agriculture. The exemption allows for the implementation of drone swarm farming, a cutting edge method of seeding and spraying crops. Helio, a Texas-based drone manufacturer, spearheaded the application for the exemption. The approval now permits fleets of drones, each weighing over 55 pounds, to operate collectively. The decision marks a significant departure from previous regulations, which restricted drones to individual operations, requiring a pilot and spotter for each unit. Drone swarms can now offer a new cost-effective farming approach, potentially reducing both initial investment and ongoing operational expenses. Now with the ability to operate multiple drones at once, farmers can cover more ground in less time, which has the capacity to significantly enhance efficiency. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is investing up to $22 million in partnerships to enhance conservation technical assistance for livestock producers and promote conservation practices on grazing lands. The USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service is soliciting proposals through its Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative until May 26th. These partnerships aim to address barriers to accessing grazing assistance, prioritize local resource concerns, and promote climate-smart agriculture. The initiative will expand technical assistance for farmers and ranchers engaged in grazing activities, fostering peer-to-peer networks, and providing financial support for mentors. 
Eligible entities include nonprofit organizations, farmer or rancher organizations, government agencies, tribal governments, and land grant universities. Applications are being accepted at grants.gov now through Sunday, May 26th. The final manual snow survey of the season from the Department of Water Resources was conducted earlier this week with some positive news heading into summer. Water Resource Engineer for DWR Andy Rising provided the readings from the measurement taken at Phillips Station. Our survey today, we recorded a depth of 64 inches and a snow water content of 27.5 inches. And that results in 113% of average for this location. And the past month of March was good to us. Precipitation and snow fell in the beginning. We had a storm that chased us out of here last month and uh, we had several storms since, and that has boosted us from 75% a, a of average to just above average for, for this water year, which is excellent news. Cooperating agencies are still measuring snow courses throughout the state today and tomorrow, but the data that we do have, our snowpack is at about 105% using that metric. Our automated snow sensor network looking this morning was about 110% of April 1st average snowpack, so we're, we're in a good place right now. Um, very similar percentages between those two ways we measure. On April 1st last year, the snowpack was well over twice its average right here. And we were in fact standing on 10 and a half feet of snow last year. This year, we're slightly more than five feet of snow. So again, last year, well over two times. And this year, we're slightly over our average. A field day showcasing research and discussing issues in cool season field crops is coming up in five points. On Thursday, April 18th, a cool season cropping systems in the San Joaquin Valley Field Day will be held at the Westside Research and Extension Center beginning at 945 in the morning. The event will begin with a presentation about deficit irrigation and water productivity in small grains, followed by information about selecting small grain varieties with improved nitrogen use efficiency and reduced environmental impacts in the San Joaquin Valley. Other topics of discussion include weed control options for ALS-resistant chickweed and wheat and glyphosate injury and glyphosate-tolerant alfalfa. Agronomy and Nutrient Management Advisor Nick Clark will also be going over garbanzo bean variety trial and plot observations. More information on the field day is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Two storm systems are making their presence felt in various ways as they impact the nation this week. Rudbane has more. Two weather systems are being observed by weather watchers like USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey through the week. The first, what Rippey described as the more powerful of the two, parked itself early this week across the middle Mississippi Valley into the Great Lakes region. It's a very large and slow moving system. We have already seen considerable weather hazards associated with this storm, including severe weather outbreaks Monday and Tuesday. The good news as we move into midweek and beyond, that severe weather threat will end fairly abruptly. Later in the week, cold is expected to be left in the wake of the early week storm. There is some concern that we could see some frost and near freezing temperatures extending all the way southward into the Tennessee Valley and the Southern Appalachians. With blooming fruit trees and heading winter wheat vulnerable to freeze. A second system is expected to bring beneficial moisture late week from the west to the Great Plains. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. How technology is increasing ag productivity. That's coming up on This Land of Ours. Technological developments in agriculture have enabled continued output growth without requiring many additional inputs. Innovations in animal and crop genetics, chemicals, equipment, and farm organization have made it possible for total agricultural output to nearly triple between 1948 and 2021. During that period, a USDA report says the amount of inputs used in farming declined slightly over time, meaning that the growth in agricultural output over the long term has depended on increases in total factor productivity. TFP measures the amount of agricultural output produced from combining inputs like labor, capital, and intermediate inputs employed in farm production. Therefore, growth in TPP indicates positive changes in the efficiency with which inputs are transformed into outputs. The USDA report says it can also be seen as an indicator of technological change. I'm Sabrina Halverson for Agnet West. It's just about time to do some needed spring yard work. Gary Crawford springs into action with this report. 
Yes, some folks up near the Great Lakes may still be shoveling snow, but for many parts of the country... Each nest is twittering, they will be sittering. It's spring, spring, spring. Ah, uh, at last. And with spring's arrival, many of us were inspired to get out in the yard and do something. And definitely... There's always a lot of chores to be done in the spring in the lawn and the garden. Kansas State University Extension Lawn and Garden expert Dennis Patton. Now, he does say that many of the things we do in the yard in the spring are actually things we probably should have done in the fall. Things like planting grass seed, most of the fertilization, and spraying for weeds. But yes, there's still a lot to do in the spring. First, we need to redo some of the raking of the leaves we did back in the fall. Winter does have a way of... Blowing more leaves around and into the yard and piling them up in places. And we want to make sure that those leaves do not pile up and bury the turf grass because it will shade and kill out the grass. Dennis Patton says even though we may have done some of these next things he's going to talk about last fall. In the spring is when we start thinking about, depending on the part of the country we're in, doing a little bit of fertilization to perk the grass up. It's also a time we look for some weed control activity, too, because we have a lot of spring blooming weeds like dandelion, tenbit, chickweed throughout the country. And then we also need to think about preparing our lawn for the weeds of summer that will be coming later. But really, Dennis says it would have been better to take care of the broadleaf weeds back in the fall. Why not use those sprays in the spring? Answer? Because they drift really easily into the breeze, and they can damage non-target plants. So it affects the, the red bud trees, the tomatoes that got planted in the spring, grapevines. Any of the trees will see a lot of curling and puckering to the foliage because of the drift of the herbicide in the atmosphere. So in the spring, he says it's better to do spot spraying of weeds, very targeted and... Use as little as possible, treat on a, on a calm day, not a windy day, to prevent the blowing in the wind. And then also large water droplets close to the soil surface so we don't get a lot of that drift and cause damage to our non-target plant. And finally, uh, yes, Dennis says when you go to cut the grass the first time, fight the urge to cut it really low. He says it hurts the grass by scalping it. The other thing is when you mow so short like that early spring, all you do is open that soil up for more sunshine. And weed seeds love nothing more than spring sunshine and warm soils to start to grow. And yes, those weeds also love spring, 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 spring. Oh, yes, in Washington, where it's uh, sort of springy, Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Whether municipal, commercial, or homeowner, knowing how to monitor and control mosquito populations will keep these pests from overpopulating later in the spring and summer. Rod Bain reports. When it comes to control of mosquito populations, whether it is a municipal entity or a private homeowner, Penn State University Extension's Jamie Kopko explains. We simply do not have the technology to completely wipe out mosquitoes. What they accomplish is a reduction. It's not an elimination of mosquitoes. So what might mosquito control look like in light of warmer days ahead? And in turn, the return of mosquito populations. Kopko says municipalities take what he calls a systematic approach. Typically, they'll have sort of set sampling points kind of all around the territory that they're in charge of taking care of where they might have light traps up to collect adult mosquitoes. They might be sampling water bodies to check for mosquito larvae. In some cases, for monitoring for mosquito-borne diseases, they'll have what are called sentinel chickens. It's basically little chicken coops, and they'll periodically do blood draws from the chickens and check for West Nile virus and other mosquito-borne diseases. And they do this just routine, continuous surveillance. Many public and private pest control entities have working knowledge of areas. For instance, how many mosquitoes in a trap within a set period of time triggers a spray treatment to reduce populations. But even with all of that systematic monitoring, they're also very responsive. If they get a bunch of calls from people in a neighborhood saying, hey, we're getting overwhelmed with mosquito bites, you got to do something about this. And typically they will investigate the matter further and if needed, go out and do a spray. Mosquito control in one's yard can vary. Some choose professional pest controllers. Some may apply chemicals on their own or through a professional. 
and some may use integrated pest management methods, although COPCO advises... Integrated pest management does include chemical methods, so using chemicals does not mean you're not using integrated pest management. That also doesn't mean there isn't all natural mosquito traps available, whether commercially or homemade. Copco provides one example. Basically, you're just like a bucket of water and you throw some grass clippings or leaf litter in it and it creates this really appealing egg-laying site for them. And it's got like a one-way door in it. So the female mosquitoes can get in hoping that they're going to lay eggs and then they can never get back out. So if that's the kind of mosquito you have, then you can use a completely non-chemical approach that the technology is a bucket with a fancy lid, and you can significantly reduce your mosquito pressure that way. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. The American Farm Bureau Federation and the National Farmers Union are working together in the FMMO modernization effort. Chad Smith has more of the joint letter urging USDA to avoid making changes to make allowances until a mandatory cost and yield survey is complete. April 1st was the post-hearing deadline for interested parties to submit briefs to the USDA on federal milk marketing order modernization. Danny Munch, an economist with the American Farm Bureau Federation, gives an update on where the modernization process currently stands. There are still a few other steps in the process. USDA now has 90 days to review all of the post-hearing briefs that were submitted on April 1st, and they will publish a proposed recommended decision to the Federal Register. Once that occurs, they can comment on the recommended rule. USDA will use those comments to make a final recommended rule, and then a referendum of farmers will be organized to vote on whether to accept or reject those changes. Munch says AFBF recently joined the National Farmers Union in sending a letter to USDA urging the department to push pause on updating make allowances. Make allowances represent the cost and a credit to processors to convert raw milk into further processed dairy products like cheese and butter. They are part of the milk pricing formula, and any increase to the make allowances lowers dairy farmers checks. Currently, there are some stakeholders in the hearing process that are pushing for make allowances to be increased based on voluntary surveys, so they don't represent all processors out in the industry. And our letter is basically saying the USDA should not increase make allowances until we have a mandatory survey that includes all processors. Munch says it's significant that Farm Bureau and Farmers Union worked together on this issue. At the end of this process, dairy farmers are the ones who ultimately vote on whether or not to accept or reject those changes. They're the only one of those stakeholders that vote on changes to federal orders. So combined, AFBF and NFU represent a consensus of those dairy farmers and really the interest that USDA should be most considering as they craft any of their proposed decisions. Chad Smith, Washington. This is the Agnet News Hour, and we will be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. Brian German has this week's Almond Update. Today's specialty crop news brought to you by the Almond Board of California. You can find them online at almonds.com. While at the Almond Conference back in December, we had a chance to speak with Northern California grower and agricultural consultant Kelly Evans about incentives that are available for industry members to take advantage of. So there really is so much, and we only covered a tip of the spear, really, in trying to navigate that area. But you, there's everything from tractors to irrigation to compost to, you know, your water bank savings. And so there's so many areas of your already operation that you can save on. And if you start learning to stack and prepare and do these in the right order, like it can save hundreds of thousands of dollars on your farm every year if you start getting the correct rotation and knowing where to go and where to apply. And uh, we'll get into some of the questions that were asked kind of from the audience. But, you know, a lot of these things are maybe already taking place on farm in in a lot of aspects. So some of it is paperwork, like you said, getting organized and, and then seeking out where those incentives are for that, right? Yeah, so there's so many different avenues to go if it's directly to an NRCS office or to a UC Extension office that has a TSP provider, a technical service provider. And so you can go to these people and you can ha- get them help and they'll help in the areas that, you know, they know or Air Board has a great one, you know, and they'll tell you what programs they have and, and being able to start there and, and start seeing what programs there are and then go from what then, what do you need? Because each organization may be the same program that they're doing and funding, but what they're wanting is very different in how that's handled. 
That was going to be my next question was maybe some of the hurdles there. Sometimes it can be language, uh, different verbiage used. I mean, uh, what are some of the things that, you know, in in your capacity that you try to help overcome and, and try to get through? Yeah, so a lot of times is unfortunately the government thinks we all farm exactly the same and we do the exact same thing and everything runs through our families exactly. And that's not the case, right? Maybe one company owns the land and one farms, or maybe everything owns and farms that one thing. Or maybe it's Grandpa Joe farms so much and I farm so much, right? Like these different avenues. And so being able to fit into their very specific cookie cutter sometimes can be difficult. And so being able to really make sure you do that properly so it maybe doesn't kick you out of the program when you could have got funded if you just changed your shape a little bit. And you mentioned stacking there, and that was one of the questions that was addressed. And um, it, it sounds like some of these can stack on each other, some can't. It's just kind of finding where those are. Yeah, it, if you can make the stars align, I call it, right? Like stacking's great, but they don't always come out at the same time. Sometimes one is out when one's closing, and that one's not coming around till next year, so you can't stack. But then within organizations, you can stack. So maybe it's not in the traditional sense that you're getting paid for the exact same thing, right? Because you can't really do that. But like NRCS has where you can maybe do a you know cover crop program or something and being water efficient and then turn around a year later and go into CSP and get paid to keep more accurate records for doing something you're already doing. So it's not double dipping, but maybe taking uh, some of your various different aspects and approaches you're doing and kind of stacking those on top of each other to really get the most that you can from some of these opportunities available. Yeah, and that's one of those things like CSP is um, Conservation Stewardship Program through NRCS, the USDA, and that program, they actually gave a ton of money back which is really, really bad. And they did not want to do that because it was so underprescribed. But if you're a grower that's already, well, I already do these things. I already am doing cover crop. I'm already doing these great things in my orchard. I'm already water efficient. Well, then you need to be signed up for this because it's literally just paying you for being a good grower into adopting these practices sooner. So, And the great thing is if you are over that 900000 just gross income or over the 450000 you know, cap for that farm bill, there are some limitations where in that area you might be able to get into and do these practices. There was another question that was asked uh, related to navel orange worm and maybe some of the incentives there. I know navel orange worm was a hot topic. It's a lot of damage this year. Uh, what are some of those avenues for that specifically that, that are available and, and how do some of those maybe work? Yeah, so the great part about NRCS is they have a wide range of programs. And so one of them is the IPM program. It can seem very overwhelming to go in at first as a grower. I even was like, oh, okay, this is, I got to say, put a step back. And then I reevaluated, I'm like, okay, I can do this. But essentially, it's being a little bit more record keeping on what you're spraying and stuff like that. And then essentially, they're going to pay you for that and keeping those good records and being a good steward of the land, which literally 99% of the stuff we already are doing is just tweaking maybe a few things and then you're going to get a flat rate per acre well that fee covers for you to be able to put that you know mating disruption in and they have where you can put strips or the puffers in which and you can pick what you know company you want to use in that so it makes it really nice to have that variety option in there. There was a question asked that is something that um, might not be considered necessarily all the time, and that relates to taxes and how some of these incentives work. I mean, what are some of the considerations there? Yeah, so essentially government's not going to give us anything for you without, you know, being maybe right their hand on it somehow so it is taxable you're going to get 1099 on if it's from feds or from state that's a given but there's a lot of options with that so essentially you're putting that money down if it's with cover crop or compost right you're paying those bills and you're getting that money it's going to wash in your books but if it's a tractor you're really wanting to make sure you purchase and get their money in that same year so then you're putting that money out for that piece of equipment right that might be 100 150,000 200,000 but then you're going to get close to that back so working with your accountant because essentially on like especially equipment or whatever you could take a lump sum because each year you're allowed to take so much of the lump sum on your taxes and so instead of depreciating that out over five seven years you could really just do a lump sum um, depreciation to wash that in your book so it really won't affect your tax bottom line for that year 
And uh, just lastly here, these incentives are available for growers. It's just a matter of seeking them out and maybe getting some assistance there with some of the maybe fairly involved uh, paperwork that goes along there. Yeah, and that's a great part is there's such a wide range of help, right? If it's through that organization, through a third-party you know, technical assistant provider that gets money from that organization to help you, to private consultants like me where we're physically doing everything because you know it's just so overwhelming they don't even want to deal with it at all like so no matter what level you're comfortable at there's somebody there to help you and these incentives are for practices that are ultimately going to be benefiting the grower uh, it's something that they've looked at want to do it's going to help their operation and this is just a way to make that a little bit easier to do Yeah, and that's a great part about it is there's so much funding out there in so many different areas. It could be helping you with something that you would probably do every year if you could, if you got paid for it, that would help maybe the crop yield or it would help with pests or it will help with just, you know, purchasing those new equipment that you are kind of been pushing off, right? And just kind of making those repairs each year to get by. So the programs are so diversified that there's so many different options or maybe it's like wow my area is I'm going to have to start doing meeting this compliance it's like well let's get funding now while there is to meet that compliant and then you don't have to worry about it. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. Thank you Brian. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. Now for more news. Pushing corn yields to new levels requires a mindset shift. Chad Smith has the details. Agrigold agronomist Nick Frederking says if farmers want to push beyond yield plateaus, they need to hone in on the details. Most farmers today take a blanket approach to managing their farm. If growers are looking to find that next level of yield on their operations, the success is going to be in the details. To move up in yield level, we need to focus on the small things, the details and not the big picture. You know, there's a lot of variables in growing crops today, whether it's soil types, pest pressures, all based on the geography that you live in. So to take a average corn yield and move it up on an operation, the key message should be don't focus on the big picture, focus on all the details that make that up. He says another way farmers can increase yield is with the planter. Right out of the gate, growers can affect their yield in their planting season. As soon as that seed goes into the planter and makes its way into the ground, there's so many things that affect success from the crop standpoint. When we look at the planter, there's so many levels to it, right? Simple maintenance on the planter, low inputs, not putting a lot of focus on it. We're probably going to maintain those baseline averages across the farm. Now, as we start to look at the details on the planter, seeding depth, plant spacing, all of these little details on the planter make up a big impact when it comes to the end of the season. Focusing on some of the details will certainly move us up the ladder, but a near flawless planter, one that has every bell and whistle turning the right way, putting the seed exactly how we want it, that's where we're going to find optimum success. Frederick King says the final area to focus on when shooting for higher yields is nutrient management. Many farmers today make a blanket approach to nutrition in their crops. When we look at the macronutrients, many growers are making the same applications every year with no thought as to why they're doing it. We get soil samples done. I find that most growers grab those soil samples, put them on a shelf, and never look at them again. That's fine for baseline yields. But again, these growers that are looking for more yield have to focus on the details. It may start with understanding how much a crop needs for those yield goals that you're looking to achieve. That's what the macros are. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, making sure our pH is right. But to climb that ladder, now we need to start focusing focusing on the micronutrients. Sulfur has made its way into the discussion as a macro slash micro. That's a good place to start. Making sure we have the right nutrients for the yield goal we're trying to obtain, that needs to be the key message there. He talks about where farmers should start when they're ready to take on the challenge of pushing yields to new levels. Focus on not changing everything at once. In fact, year one, I would strongly suggest establishing a baseline with whatever technology you want to use. Some of my favorites are tissue samples, soil samples, but we certainly know that there's drones and yield technology, so much technology available to us. The key message though, first year, establish a baseline for what you're already doing. 
find out where your limiting factors are today. And then in the second year, don't change 12 things at once. Focus on one, two, maybe three things at most. Don't get in a rush to change everything. We need to understand where these changes are coming from. If you're ready to dive deeper and identify what's holding back your yields, reach out to your local AgriGold agronomist or visit agrigold.com. Chad Smith reporting. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Serena Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Bryant German and Sabrina Halvertson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.